Good morning. It's 8.30 on Monday, May 20th. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, hurricane season starts soon and researchers predict an active summer and fall for storms. Then broadband providers discuss how to connect folks across Mississippi to the Internet. Plus, a new documentary airs tonight on MPB TV about the first counterculture rock station in the Southeast, Jackson's WZZQ. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Researchers say this year could have a higher number of named hurricanes and tropical storms than normal. Hurricane season starts in less than two weeks and runs through November. Last year, only Hurricane Idalia made landfall in the U.S., although 20 storms were named. This year, roughly 23 named hurricanes are predicted, including five major ones. That's according to David Holt, professor of geography at the University of Southern Mississippi, Long Beach campus. He tells our Michael McEwen, most of this change is driven by warmer than average water temperatures in the West Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico. We have an El Nino that is very strong and prevalent is when we end up with a lot of warm water shifts from the West Pacific to the East Pacific. And then when it uh, corrects itself, if you will, the the waters shift back the other direction. So a La Nina is when it it overcorrects, if you will. We need to get even warmer on the West Pacific and cooler on the uh, East Pacific. And so that has an impact on storm tracks and pathways. Really what impacts with La Nina is that wind shears change and um, where those storms develop change, to, you know, this is statistically speaking. And then we also have what's I think driving that model, because the model is just an educated guess, if you will, so it's only going to be as good as the inputs that we have, is that we're looking at sea surface temperatures that are higher than average already. So we've already had an invest back in April, so there was already an area that met the criteria that could be a tropical storm this year, as opposed to waiting until June 1st. Yeah, I see that the North Atlantic specifically, you know, around, I guess, the Caribbean and up the east coast of Florida and the Carolinas, um, that area of sea temperature has been setting records for warmth, you know, basically this entire year, I think even going into 2023. Um, yeah, last year as well. You're correct, yeah. So we've been seeing right. record temperatures. We've had really warm winters mm-hmm. uh, statistically along the Gulf Coast uh, last year and this year. So we had another record-breaking warm year again. So the sea surface temperatures are able to warm up nicely. Um, if you look down around Cuba, we've got temperatures at 88 degree, degrees Fahrenheit already. Um, and then, you know, the magic temperature is 26.5 degrees Celsius. That's roughly about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so all the other conditions are relatively easy to meet. Um, all you really need is a uh, conditions that are, you know, you've got a good thunderstorm moving in with an easterly wave. And then once that starts rotation, then we start getting really curious about is it going to form the eyewall structure? Is it going to form a rotation? And then those bands start driving the machine. And so what I think what's the most fascinating thing about the predictability models are, you know, we we can't predict tropical storm development into hurricane. That's probably the scariest thing for predictors is how do you have confidence that a storm's going to develop or not develop once it is formed. Um, so we had some, you know, alarming records. Uh, just last year in the Pacific, we had a hurricane Otis that it developed 115 miles per hour in 24 hours. Um, the record is, uh, I think it's 2015, um, that was in the Pacific Ocean as well, Patricia. Um, easy to remember, Pacific and Patricia. And that one jumped 120 miles per hour in 24 hours period of time. And so it's these storms that are coming in that we've got to pay attention to. And the prediction models, you know, they're they're good, but they're not there, especially when we're trying to look at a forecast for the season is – we get a lot of storms. How many of those are going to become major storms? Does that in any way change, you know, the approach to forecasting and just coastal communities preparing for hurricane season? If, you know, even a day out, a storm could just rapidly expand and strengthen like that? 
Yeah, so, you know, hurricanes, when you look at them, there's several things that you've got to pay attention to. One is obviously we, we focus at that eye wall where the maximum speed is. But there's also a breadth of a hurricane, like how how big is that hurricane? Like how far does hurricane force winds or tropical force strength winds stretch out from the center? You know, so you take a storm like Katrina, you know, famous Katrina, it was the swath of damage was monstrous as opposed to Wilma was very strong, but she was really small um, compared to other storms. And so with this rapid formation of development, it it it's a little bit frightening to not to, you know, to not to drum up anything, but it, it's concerning. And so I think another thing that happens with those storms is that, you know, when they come in, you know, my, my, the one I like to fall back on is one that, you know, hit me directly down here on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi is Hurricane Zeta was supposed to be a cat, fast moving category one. And it was really late in the season um, because, you know, we're picking up Halloween decorations from that thing. Um, but that actually came in. Um, it was classified as a Category 3 after the storm hit. So we had a, had a major storm that wasn't supposed to be a major storm, wasn't predicted to be a major storm, and then it came in. And because it was so late in the season, we boarded up so many times, we prepared for so many storms, they didn't hit us. And then this one came in and, you know, took shingles off my house, it knocked the fence down, brought down a tree, neighbors lost roof, whole nine yards. And that was in a storm that, you know, you know, anecdotally, there wasn't a lot of preparation in my neighborhood for it. Where in the beginning of the season, we pay a lot of attention. We're really focused on this. So the big lesson about these hurricanes, especially with really warm waters and these record warmths that we have in winter, is that you just you've got to stay vigilant. You've got to stay prepared for all of them. Um, with a storm like Otis that develops that fast in 24 hours, you can't you can't evacuate people with just a 24 hour notice, you know, big storms, it takes a long time to get everybody out of there. And so when you have a storm that's large and it's approaching, people are ready for it. But those storms that use the term blow up very quickly, they can cause significant damage and loss of life. David Holt is professor of geography at the University of Southern Mississippi. He studies weather patterns. Coming up, broadband providers discuss how to connect folks across Mississippi to the Internet. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. It's midnight. This is WZZQ in Jackson, Mississippi, and I'm David Adcock. My name is Sergio. I'm Victor. This is Johnny Summer. This is Avelia. Sebastian on Suzy Q. I'm Perez, and I definitely talk dirty. It was just this fleeting little thing. And we had a really good version of it in Jackson, Mississippi, which, you know, what are the odds of that? Sebastian saying good night. And this is WZZQ in Jackson. WZZQ The Movie, Monday, May 20th at 8 p.m. on MPB TV. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Leaders in the public and private sectors of Mississippi Broadband Association are discussing the state's ongoing efforts to expand Internet access to those places that don't have it. Mississippi has received around $1.2 billion from the federal government to connect unserved and underserved homes and businesses with high-speed broadband. The Federal Communications Commission is working on a national map to show everywhere coverage is needed. Those national officials are also praising Mississippi for its own map of Internet service, highlighting coverage areas and where broadband isn't available. Our Kobe Vance speaks with Sally Doty, director of the Mississippi Broadband Office, also known as BEAM. She says coordinating with the private sector is a major part of ensuring folks get reliable Internet, regardless of where they live or work. It involves certainly, number one, deployment, the building out of networks in unserved areas. But it also has to do with device ownership and digital skills and affordability. So a lot of different issues all wrapped up that we talked about today. Now, it's been a while since we've talked to you all at BEAM. Uh, how are things going there? How are How's the rollout of all the finances that came in going? So we have moved about $44 million in preliminary awards under the Capital Projects Fund to final, which means those projects can now begin and all of our grants are done on a reimbursement basis. So the providers 
uh, begin the work, submit their invoices. Uh, we reimburse them on a month, usually a, a monthly basis. So we are um, are getting the that 44 million in funding released, uh, and it, those projects will happen over the course of the next couple of years. You know, these are large scale construction projects so it, it it takes a while to build it out some are quicker than others and you know a lot of times it depends on your uh terrain your geography permits you've got to get so every every project is a little bit different we have that 40 million and then right behind it we have some other projects that are almost ready about 20 million that are almost ready to go but they had some um objections uh, there is a, a process in, in Mississippi law that allows objections to a preliminary work award. Uh, for example, another provider might object and say, oh, we serve these 20 locations in that award. And so we are investigating those objections and resolving those. So once we get that done, we will have um, some more funding released. And then we will continue on um, – there's still some remaining funding that will be awarded out of that capital projects fund as well. So that's capital projects fund. And then, you know, our big bucket of money is BEAD, which is the $1.2 billion. And we are working through all of the different requirements for it. Our next requirement to have that funding released is to run a, a challenge process. And we've been talking about this for quite some time. Uh, we had to wait till we got federal approval. Uh, which we have now, but the feds are also about to update their map, and our map is linked to and dependent on that federal map. So probably going to wait till that map update happens first of June to then run our challenge process. The FCC was there speaking on their map that they've been working on, and I know that y'all's office has been working on y'all's map as well pretty diligently over the past few years. Uh, or what are your thoughts on comparing the two maps? Uh, do you think Mississippi's has been able to go deeper than what the federal maps yes. have been able to do so far? Oh, for sure. So um, I, I'm I'm really proud of our, our mapping efforts in, in Mississippi. And, uh, you know, kind of the backbone of our, our data does rely on that federal map. What we use is the information that our Internet service providers are required to report to make that federal map, called the NBAM, the National Broadband Map. Providers are now required twice a year to report into that map. Uh, a few years ago, it was only once a year. We kind of, with this bead process spinning out, they've they've upped their reporting obligation. So, the providers report their service areas and their speeds, and we incorporate that into our map. So what we also, though, have done on our map is identified a lot of locations that were missing on the federal map. So we've been challenging the federal map all along the way, adding locations, and somewhere I have a number of how many locations we've added. It's thousands. Um, and then also the federal map did not initially show um, federal funding that had already been awarded. And we have a lot of federal funding, different federal programs that have awarded funding for broadband expansion in Mississippi, and we cannot provide additional federal funding on top of that. So it's important for us as the state broadband office to know exactly where that federal funding was so we would not overlap as we make our plans towards funding for BEAD. Sally Doty is director of the Mississippi Broadband Office. Next, a new documentary airs tonight on MPB TV about the first counterculture rock station in the Southeast, Jackson's own WZZQ. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm guessing that MPB Think Radio is the number one preset on your radio and you listen all the time. But if you need some unplugged listening suggestions, try a binge of one of our podcasts. 
Our weekend shows, This American Life and Radio Lab, are great to have downloaded for when you're traveling or at the beach. Don't forget about our local shows. Now you're talking in Creature Comforts, our terrific experiences anytime. MPB Podcasts for your listening pleasure anywhere. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. A new documentary airing tonight on MPB TV dives into the history of what was once the first counterculture rock station in the Southeast. We sit down with filmmaker Ann Ford and the former news staffer Bill Ellison to discuss why WZZQ FM was such a groundbreaking radio station in the capital city. I grew up with WZZQ. Uh, I was I was just a teen when it changed to country, and I think back in the days before internet, this really was the center of our community. You know, my my high school friends and I, we listened all the time. We 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 called in and requested music. We felt like the DJs were our friends, the announcers, the personalities were our friends, and. We would go to the events. I mean, it was just a big central part of our life. And even now, with people of a certain age here, you can say, you ever listen to WZZQ? And you'll get these stories. I mean, people even now, people are so passionate about it. On July 29th, 1968, just five years ago, WJDX-FM became Jackson's and Mississippi's first and only FM rock station. We've been through a lot of changes in those five years, some for the better and some for the worse. And now we announce still one more change. With the dawn of the new day comes the new rock. What was WJDX-FM is now WZZQ. Well, the, the rock portion of it started in 1968 as WJDX-FM. And then in 1973, it changed to w, WZZQ. So, and it was WZCQ until it became WMSI, Miss 103, in 1981. So if you were a teenager any time in the late 60s to 1980 or so, you would have listened. Yeah, that's the age range. That's about right. And those people who, who were teenagers and young adults at that point, to use an overused term, it was a cult following of... Uh, <laughs> But in a good way. In a good way, yeah. It, it really had a, a, a loyal listener base. But it was and a young listener loyal base. Loyal listener base back then. Yeah, teens and, and, and 20s. And those folks now are in their, what, 60s and, you know, late 50s, 60s, uh, even some in their 70s, like I resemble that remark. <laughs> uh, but those people still remember it passionately, still remember it. What made it so special for young people? The music. Well, I would say the music, but also was the people. Was it countercultural? Yeah. Yeah. Was it yeah. countercultural? It was yes. countercultural. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, so you you have a better memory of this than well, I do. Well, it, it at the time uh, in radio uh, radio stations in Jackson, Mississippi, and also in any city in America at the time, you had a few choices. You had uh, uh, what the old folks listened to. You had a country station, and you had a top forty station. You know, on the top forty, you had good music. You know, you had you had soul music, you had top forty teeny bop music, but there was no at that time. You had bands, uh, uh, music like the Beatles and Led Zeppelin and and what you called underground. underground rock. I would say underground. Underground yeah. rock that nobody played. You know, kids listened to it. They had to go buy the album and take it home and listen to it. The Beatles were considered well. Some of their stuff. Some of their was, stuff was, was some of their stuff, but uh, and you had an emerging uh, uh, underground rock. To, Grateful Dead. Yeah. Jefferson Airplane. You know the San Francisco mm. psychedelic rock mm -hmm. that was coming in in the '60s. Nobody played that on the radio. The, the this station did. His eyes closed for the fashion conscious chicks. I want something different. And coming soon, the Judy Cream Cheese Back Room. Okay. Well, your movie, the movie, includes actual on-air recordings and so forth. Tell us how you approach this. Yes. Um, I have to, have to give a special thank you to someone who's no longer with us, Curtis Jones, who was Sebastian on WZZQ. Um, he and, and Johnny Summer had digitized a lot of their air checks 
from the 70s, from the mid-70s. And he was kind enough to share those with me. And so this this movie has original WZZQ audio in it that aired. But because it came from the station, it sounds wonderful. You would be hard-pressed to even recognize it as being radio. But it, it was. And, you know, you'll hear Sebastian, Johnny Summer, Sergio Fernandez, um, all of these, David Adcock, of course. All of these people that, if you listen to ZZQ, you knew these guys and you love them. And Perez, of course. Of course. Is the building still there? Yes. Where was it located? It's on Be. Yeah, Beasley Road. Well, it started out uh, uh, when the station uh, first began. It was on Jefferson Street uh, in the studios at WLBT. At the time, the station was owned by w by Lamar Life Insurance Company. That's a whole another story. But uh, at WLBT, and of course, WLBT is still at 715 South Jefferson Street. Well, the studios were upstairs above their main news studio where you see Howard Ballou and Maggie Wade every, every night at 10. You look up at the corner there, that's where WZZQ was located. So did you have a big staff? Or was it just a few people? From- it was just it was very small at that time. Now, later they moved out to Beasley Road when WLBT Channel Three and the radio station separated. They moved out to Beasley Road. Those studios are still there. At the heyday in the seventies, yeah, it had a big staff. You know, there were probably fifty people. Of course, they had wow. WJDX AM and WZZQ FM. It was Housed a big radio the station in the same facility. Yeah. Yep. And I nearly neglected to mention that Dan Fogelberg started us out in that segment. But- be on your way. Fogelberg is on his way to Jackson. Ah, it's public knowledge. Yeah. Uh-huh. What date? You think February twenty second, as it is. I don't want to cause any uproar. Any uproar. Tickets are not available as yet, but uh, they will be. I I'm assume. glad you said that. I was just waiting for the phone to. Yeah, I know. Go crazy over the next hour. Since it was rock, did it appeal to Mississippians, black Mississippians? Mississippians of other races, because usually you equate rock with mostly white performers. Well, the, 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 Anne, I'm going to defer to Ann on this because she, but I will tell you this: she mentioned Perez, who is <clears throat> uh, P- Perez is African American, and he was one of the bedrocks of this station. You had at the time the rock, rock at the time, Led Zeppelin, Beatles, uh, Grateful Dead. Ninety nine percent of the appeal was white audience, but. There were black kids that listened to that, too, and Perez was one of them. Perez was one of the probably the most knowledgeable of any of the DJs in this genre of music, which has always been interesting. But, yeah, it was mostly a white appeal. Well, I, I would say that uh, what Bruce Owen told me, Bruce Owen was also one of the, the really early DJs on WJDX-FM when it was truly freeform. And <clears throat> Randall Bingston said this as well, that a lot of the music they played wasn't only rock. You know, they would play That's true. That they would yeah. play Al Green, they would they would play Rotary Connection, they would play Roberta Flack and Billy Preston and and these other, you know, black artists who are who were just are wonderful and they were very much a part of the station. And I forgot about uh Ann mentioned <laughs> Randall Pinkston. Randall was one of the uh early DJs. African American. Yes. Okay. Randall he of went course, on to work at CBS. Yeah, as, as the a Washington correspondent. correspondent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he started at, at at ZZQ. Sounds like a wonderful trip down memory yeah, lane. Yeah, absolutely. For those who were there and experienced yeah. it. And we appreciate you both. Bill Ellison, who worked in news at WZZQ. Right. And Ann Ford, who directs the WZZQ movie. Yes. So fantastic. Thousands will watch it Monday night on MPB as well and all the other airings. It's really going to be a wonderful treat for folks, I believe. Yeah. Thank you. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio.